Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, SciCom Monday. Uh, thank you to everyone for sticking around. Um, we're live streaming on Periscope, and it's a, a newer uh, format of things, so there's always chances of things going wrong, chances of things that could go wrong. But uh, uh, we're going to give this a go again and see if we can get uh, everyone's comments in because we really want to be able to hear from everyone. So that's why we're uh, sticking around for a, a second or third half hour now. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever uh, it takes, whatever it takes. Yes, definitely. So if you're uh, new to the broadcast, please feel free to uh, send in all your questions and comments via the uh, chat module on uh, Periscope here. If you're watching this on replay, uh, feel free to uh, tweet myself either at the SciCom Monday handle or at the Wildlife BioGal handle, and we'll uh, try to engage with your questions uh, that way. So today's guest, who has been gracious enough to uh, stick around for yet a little bit more fun and have the whole deja vu of doing this over again, <laughs> is uh, Dr. Joanna Huckster. You can reach her at uh, doc underscore hucks on uh, Twitter. And uh, with that, I just got to say, uh, Joanna, thanks yeah. for sticking around. It's great. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Anytime. Yeah, I, I, it seemed more fun to let, let everyone in on the conversation that we had yeah. for about a good 20 minutes without anyone being there. So. Yeah. <laughs> great conversation. I'm yeah. sorry you all missed it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so any questions that any of you have when it comes to uh, climate change and engagement or... Uh, that you have for Joe, definitely uh, feel free to start sw sending them and because uh, uh, that's that's the whole point of this show is to uh, get that engagement from everyone. <laughs> so uh, for like the few people who actually weren't tuned in during our first two attempts with this broadcast today, uh, why don't you tell them a little bit about yourself, Joe? Um, I work at, uh, well, I actually just finished working at Bucknell University um, on a project called the Production of Public Understanding of Science, and um, I studied um, marine policy with a concentration in climate change communication, and I'm going to start an assistant professorship at Eckerd College this fall, uh, and I will be teaching environmental communication and climate change communication and intro courses in environmental studies. Great. I are you excited about the uh, the fun of uh, starting a whole new uh, program, you know, down yes. somewhere else? Like I've, I've talked to uh, other uh, professors that I know, and it always seems like that first semester is really uh, uh, quite a fun ride is how they usually tend to put it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Type two fun. Um, right. I think it's going to be great. Um, I'm really excited because these courses, the environmental communication course and the climate change community course, communication course that I'm developing. This is the first time that I'm really fleshing these out and I'm going to get to teach them. So I'm really excited to see how um, something, a topic that I've taught as like a section of a climate change course, um, how I can flush it out into a full course by itself, because this is what I really do. I do public understanding of science and public understanding of climate change and climate change communication. So getting to teach something I'm passionate about um, is really exciting for me. So hopefully, um, I enjoy it as much as I think I'm going to enjoy it. Yeah, it, it's 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 always uh, interesting to see how uh, people get started in their careers and how you know it's that those first couple of years of fun of being a professor. It's a, a lot of just mad, just dashing to like keep up with uh, everything. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah uh, I'm excited. <laughs> so why don't you uh, talk to us a little bit about what climate change actually is. So for those people who are, are tuning in and just randomly found this on Periscope, you know, can be kind of brought up to speed with uh, the scientists that are also uh, tuning in as well. So um, we talked about climate change um, uh, earlier as being the um, climate change is actually the, the larger uh, process in which um, the Earth's climate fluctuates over time. Um, and anthropogenic climate change and recent uh, rapid climate change is what has been due to an increase in uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere due to human activity, uh, specifically since we started burning fossil fuels for uh, energy in um, the Industrial Revolution. Um, and climate change refers to all of the aspects of the climate that are changing because of um, an increase in global temperatures, which is called global warming. So global warming means the av increase in average temperature of the lower levels of the atmosphere and the Earth's surface, 
And climate change refers to all of the things that go along with that. So that includes increases in precipitation or changes in precipitation patterns like drought, um, increases in storm frequency. Those are all changes in climate. And then global warming is just that temperature increase. And that's something that people commonly confuse or think of as exactly the same thing. And you can talk about them as the same thing when you're having conversations about climate or about global warming, especially if people seem to be more comfortable with one word over the other um, or one term over the other. But they actually mean slightly different things. Uh, great. Um, so for uh, those of you who are uh, currently watching, uh, definitely feel free to uh, send in your uh, questions. We love to uh, have that active engagement. So uh, when it comes to climate change, what are some of the biggest misconceptions that people have when it comes to climate change? You know, for I mean, even for those of us who are scientists that might have you know misconceptions about it. Mm-hmm. So um, some of the things that I usually talk about with misconceptions, well, first of all, there's misconceptions about whether or not um, current rapid climate change is caused by human influences or not. Um, And there's misconceptions about whether or not there's a scientific consensus about that. If you ask the average American um, about whether or not scientists agree that there is climate change, um, many of them will will grossly underestimate the number of climate scientists who um, believe that climate change is because of anthropogenic causes and have studied that. Um, but also there are misconceptions about the difference between weather and climate. Um, weather is the day-to-day pattern or on a very local level of what's going on around you, whereas climate is a much longer term and um, larger area term. So um, I like to say to my students, and I said this earlier, so if you've heard this already, I'm sorry, but um, climate is how you choose where it is you're going to go for vacation, and then weather is how you choose what you're going to pack on that individual trip. Um, so they are they are different things that are related to one another. Is that something that like people are always like, you know, as you're talking to folks, that's like just super common, they're always flipping those two back and forth? Yes, and people people frequently flip them back and forth, and also it is a way that makes it makes it difficult for people to understand that climate change is happening because on a day to day basis they say, well, it's cold outside right now, or um, a senator comes and throws a snowball um, in the Senate because that's weather, and individual days of weather aren't climate. Um, and it also makes it difficult to communicate about climate change because um, people have these misconceptions that if it's cold outside right now, that the climate isn't changing and that um, the earth isn't warming. But also, um, because things like weather are driven by multiple factors coming in at once, you can't contrib- or attribute one individual storm to climate change, for instance. So when people say that Hurricane Sandy was because of climate change, you can't say that. Um, we can't, scientists can't say that, but you can say that Sandy was more likely to occur because of climate change and more storms like Sandy are more likely to continue occurring because of climate change. Um, and those sort of nuances are the types of things that make it really difficult for people to understand really what climate change is. So that difference between weather and climate is an important distinction to make. And if people get that, they may have a better chance of understanding why it is it can still snow outside, um, and why it is maybe in some places it's actually more likely to snow than it ever was um, because of changes in climate. Right. So like um, if we get like we got a 60 degree day in January here in mm-hmm. Michigan, which is mm-hmm. just absolutely insane. Like it, that just doesn't happen. We always have some melts, yeah. but to have it be 60 degrees and people were showing mm-hmm. up out at the beaches on the Great mm-hmm. Lakes, it was just so shocking. But that one individual day doesn't necessarily mean that there's climate change. It'd be when there's that trend of that there's multiple mm-hmm. days that build up throughout the years. And it's yeah. because of certain issues, you know, like you said, that right. anthropogenic or that human caused um, climate change is causing mm-hmm. those trends of the, the days to pop up. Right. So. so, yeah, I can't say that, you know, next January, you will have that many days that are 60 degrees. But I can say it's more likely that you will have 60 degree days in January, which doesn't sound so bad right this second, but <gasps> but um, in some places that also means that it's more likely that they will never get rain. Or um, for instance, in Pennsylvania, that we'll have many, many days over 90 degrees. So in our January, we actually ended up with a couple of days in the 80s, um, which was just weird. <laughs> so um, that the fact that that could happen um, and that those the chances of that happening increase 
that is that can be attributed to climate change. Mm -hmm. So we had a question uh, come in asking, would climate change happen without uh, human activity? I believe was what the question was asked. That's a good question. So, I mean, the Earth's climate has, of course, changed over time. And people talk about that all all the time. And they like to bring that up. Um, What climate change in in general would happen without human activity. Um, In fact, one of the things that's been posited uh, recently um, is that we would actually be starting to move towards an ice age right now if it hadn't been for human activity. Um, But, and that's something that's been talked about a fair amount in the science, but um, what we are seeing, what we wouldn't be seeing if it weren't for human activity, we wouldn't be seeing the drastic increase in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. And because of that, we wouldn't be seeing this drastic increase in uh, global temperatures. Um, And that part can only be attributed to human activity. And there are, um, you can look at graphs of what kinds of solar radiation has been changing over time and how volcanic activity has changed over time and um, how the Earth's orbit has changed over time. And none of those factors can predict the increase, the drastic increase in temperatures that we've seen. And the only thing that really matches up with that is um, the combination of our greenhouse gas emissions and our aerosol emissions. Because if you just follow the greenhouse gas emissions, we actually would be higher, it would be warmer than it is now. But our aerosol emissions, which are bad for other reasons like acid rain, actually create um, a little bit of global cooling. um, So that matches up almost perfectly with the temperature uh, observations that we make now. Um, So for instance, there's this graph up that uh, Nicole has put up that shows Um, using ice core data going back 800,000 years, it shows how our um, temperature, how Earth's temperature fluctuates along the same lines as carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And if you look at that over the last 800,000 years, you'll see that we move 200 parts per million in carbon dioxide and our temperature changes drastically. But what you see at the end of that graph is a sharp upswing. And that sharp upswing starts right at the Industrial Revolution or just after. And that's a sharp upswing in carbon dioxide and a sharp upswing in temperature following that. And that can only be explained by human activity. Yeah, so like you're talking about uh, ice core data. So can you tell us a little bit about how scientists are using these ice cores to be able to get this data? Because that's one of the questions that uh, my family has asked me was, Mm -hmm. so how do you know what the temperature was 20,000 years ago? Ice core data is so cool. So they drill into, you know, a massive ice sheet and they pull out these beautiful, like clear cores. And just like, um, rings of a tree, they actually have these striations in them. And those are markings of time. And the way that they can determine the concentration of different, um, chemicals in the atmosphere and the temperature is by little bubbles of air that are trapped in those ice cores. And the the types of gas that's in those ice cores um, can help them to determine both how the atmosphere, what the atmosphere looked like, what was in it, and the temperature based on different isotopes there. Um, So it's really, really neat. And they can use that ice core data to track back our temperature and our um, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas um, concentrations in the atmosphere for, you know, up to 800,000 years, depending where they are able to get those cores. Um, so that stuff is really interesting and um, well known in solid science um, that's been followed for a very long time. Yeah. So we had a, a comment come in uh, saying that uh, uh, didn't Al Gore say that New York was going to be underwater? So I guess could you explain a little bit of like you know some of the processes of how how much time are we talking about before mm. some of these big drastic impacts yeah. that we've been predicting could be happening? Because like I've heard that there's islands out in the Pacific that are starting to have issues with mm. flooding because of the sea level rises. Yeah, yeah. So one of the biggest things about um, we always talk about is in in uncertainty dealing with climate change change is uncertainty in our predictions of what exactly are going to happen. And one of the main reasons for that is we aren't really sure what humans are going to do. We aren't sure if we're going to deal with this or not. So how quickly it takes, for instance, the flooding to happen that would take over New York 
I mean, part of that has a lot to do with what we do. If we continue to burn greenhouse gases the way we are and we continue with the upswing in burning of, I'm sorry, of fossil fuels, not we don't burn the greenhouse gases. If we burn the fossil fuels the same way that we are now, that will happen more quickly. Um, if we start to deal with it now, um, it won't happen. It'll take more time. Unfortunately, we've already committed ourselves to about two, maybe more degrees of climate change, of increase in temperature globally, as it already is. So um, one of the things with um, carbon dioxide is, and the greenhouse effect is that there's actually a delay in the effect. So the things we're seeing right now come from emissions that were made many years ago. So even if we were to stop 100% putting out carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases today, which is we can't do that right this second, but if we were to do that, we would still see an increase in temperature and we would still see sea level rise. But the timing, the exact timing of that, we can't know because we can't predict how humans are going to act. But there are you know, multiple scenarios that we've tried to map out. Um, and there are already places that are going underwater. So for instance, the Maldives, um, those islands have been rapidly losing shoreline um, and they will continue to do so. And um, the predictions now are that with two degrees climate change, those islands um, may actually still be completely wiped out. Um, and in which case we're going to have refugees from those, we're gonna have environmental refugees who need to go somewhere. Um, the, you know, the timelines on the US are obviously a little, uh, we're a little more above sea level. Um, and we're also in colder areas. Um, so the, the expansion of the water, although there's globally, the whole ocean is going to expand. We aren't gonna see some of the same problems that we aren't gonna lose all of New York probably, especially if we deal with this now, but we will, um, we will have some flooding um, and some higher, higher sea levels. What we will also have is when a storm comes in, there will be higher storm surges and there will be more damage from the storms. So it's not necessarily that all of the streets you know of in New York are gonna be covered in water, it's that the storms are gonna create more damage like they did with Sandy um, than they would have otherwise because they're gonna come in stronger and the sea level is gonna be slightly higher. Um, but places like Florida are going to lose um, a fair amount of land um, uh, even if we don't do anything, I mean, if, even if we stop everything now, we're still going to lose some some of Florida because it is so low lying. Yeah, so like I, I've heard like that there's already some uh, uh, changes in Miami, like they're actually having flooding that they're attributing to mm -hmm. uh, climate change uh, down there, and that yeah. it's you know. I can't remember if it was Miami where it was the picture of the octopus that was in a like a parking garage or something mm -hmm. along those lines, yeah. and they're like. It's happening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like we said, we can't say that this one individual flood was definitely because of climate change, but the more frequently they happen and the more frequently they happen at rates that we have never seen before is when we can say, yeah, the pattern is pretty clear here. Um, so, you know, I think one of the drivers, one of the things we're going to see that's going to be really interesting, I think, this is just a personal prediction, although I've seen other people say it, is that um, we're going to see some real push from insurance companies um, to deal with climate because um, they're going to be on the hook for things like damage from storms and flooding and, and things of that nature. So we're going to see a real difference in things like flood insurance rates, which are already pretty high in Florida. Um, but that's a, that's a whole different topic. <laughs> it's not where my expertise lies. Um, no, but I mean, that's, that's an interesting aspect, though, is maybe some of those economic drivers could be the thing that helps push people to accept that climate change is actually happening as they start seeing maybe their insurance bills go up and like, oh, this really is something that we need to pay attention to. So one of the, when we do climate change communication, one of the things we do is something called framing, which is where you try to talk about climate change in terms of a subject that means the most to the person you're talking to. Um, and economic framing can be a tricky one because um, there are a lot of things about how we're going to have to deal with climate that go beyond things like laissez-faire economics and, um, and the free market economy. So we're going to have to have more regulation. It's just going to have to happen. But when we talk about um, when you talk about climate change with people, if you are talking to somebody who cares a lot about the economy and cares a lot about uh, impacts to themselves personally or impacts to the economy of the country, that is one way to actually talk about climate change um, that might make sense to them because the economic impacts of dealing with 
extra flooding and extra storms. And um, there's going to be rising health care costs due to heat exposure and asthma increases. Um, there's going to be extra health costs associated with disease spread. So these are ways of talking about climate change that may actually ring a bell for somebody who does not care about a polar bear um, and doesn't even necessarily care, not that they're heartless, but it's hard to think about somebody living far, far away on the other side of the world who's being impacted. If you bring it closer to home um, and to a subject that matters to them, and it can even be a lighthearted subject, like for instance, if you know someone who loves snowboarding or skiing, talking about the impacts on snowfall um, which have already been um, recorded in um, the West and some here in Pennsylvania as well, um, how it's going to impact even their hobbies um, is might be something that just flips a switch for them when you're trying to talk about climate. Right, yeah, because like this uh, past winter, I like going snowshoeing. I didn't go snowshoeing once at all, and I, I live up in Michigan, which, you know, we get a lot of that lake effect snow, and it just wasn't there enough to like, make it worth truly getting them out like yeah I got them out of the bag and I think I walked in the backyard for about two feet and that was about it and I'm just like it's not even <laughs> worth it even as badly as I want to go out and use them it's just like it's not worth it yeah uh -oh. and you may you know you'll you'll probably get to snowshoe again it's not over um next winter might be better but over time there'll be fewer and fewer winters with good snowshoeing or good snowboarding and you know I it's hard for me to frame it in terms of things like that because um, I find the human impact parts of it um, and the biological impacts and the ecological impacts, those are the things that are really gut-wrenching to me. But it might be that someone would care about those things, but they haven't really found the topic that connects climate to them personally. And that's when they would start to really delve into it and understand more. Right. So one of the things that I've been seeing a lot on the different boards and platforms that I follow is scientists and other people who are, you know, interested in science, you know, how do they talk to their family and friends mm -hmm. or maybe even like their, you know, social media communities about mm -hmm. climate change. So if you were to like start that conversation up with one of your family or friends or Facebook mm -hmm. pals, like how would you broach the subject in a way that they yeah. can understand it and get it? Yeah. So I, I always say that one of the first things you need to do is to know your audience. Um, and so if you're talking with a friend or a family member, um, you probably have some kind of idea where they're coming from, what their political background is, what interests them. Um, and that gives you a good place to start a conversation with them. Um, if you don't know the person at all or have just met someone or someone has started this conversation with you, um, one of the first things you can do is try to get that understanding, to ask a few questions to really get to know where they are with the science. Do they know the science? Do they understand it? Um, do they not believe in it? Um, and getting that background can really help shape how you have the rest of the conversation. Um, it's always awkward to just walk up to somebody and say, hey, I'm worried about climate change, are you? But, um, but that can be one of the ways to do it is to just sort of bring it up as something that you've been thinking about a lot recently and then ask them questions instead of just start preaching about how climate change works and what the science is, asking them questions about what are they concerned about, um, what bothers them. And a lot of times what you're going to get is someone saying, um, you know, I believe in climate change or I'm, I'm worried about climate change, but I have so many other things to worry about right now. And the the next step for me is to find a grain of truth in what they say. So if they say that, I might say, you know what, you are right. There are so many things to worry about right now. What are you most concerned with? And by asking that, you're going to get an idea about where their values lie. You're going to get to know if economics are something they're concerned about or if they're concerned about immigration or um, if they're concerned about, you know, feeding their family that day. And that can help uh, act as a bridge into climate change. One of the things I pride myself on being able to do is find a connection between almost anything and climate. Because as soon as you can do that, you can have that conversation with anybody. Um, and then the other really big important thing that I always say is that you should set a goal for yourself in these conversations. So um, especially if you're going into a conversation with someone you think might argue with you or may disagree with you, to, to have a goal in mind of where you want to go. And that doesn't necessarily have to be to win a fight or to win an argument or to convert them into an environmentalist. Um, the goal of the conversation can simply to hear them and to be heard. 
or um, to introduce to them a new type of renewable energy that they hadn't thought of or to just make that one connection, one step connection further with them where they hadn't really thought about how um, dealing with climate change was going to actually have less of a negative economic impact than having climate change happen, um, which all of the studies, all of the economic studies show that this is true. I mean, yes, there will be economic problems that come from dealing with climate change, but they're nothing compared to the economic issues we're gonna get into for not de dealing with it. So any, if you come in with this goal for yourself, rather than I'm going to win this, um, it becomes less intimidating for you as well because you don't feel the same kind of pressure. All you have to do is you know, have the conversation and be proud of yourself for doing it um, rather than you know, finding a new believer. <laughs> Yeah, and like you know, speaking of like you know the different things that are driving uh, people's beliefs or understanding of climate change is the the thought process of that it's really dividing along party lines at least here mm -hmm. in the U.S. I, I'm not mm -hmm. you know 100 percent sure about the rest of the world. So can you tell us a, a little bit about uh, that? Like, is that mm -hmm. you know something that's new or has that been ongoing? Mm. So um, it's relatively new. Uh, and by that, I mean that the real partisan divide over climate change happened in the late 90s, early 2000s. Before that, we all sort of believed the same thing. Um, and then that divide be became um, part of the political conversation. And when that happened, it started to create this increasing divide between um, conservatives or, or um, Republicans and Democrats or liberals. Um, and this divide has been, like actually many political subjects, um, it has been increasing over time. And so one of the things that I used to study um, was what drives that divide. So I would use aggregate public opinion data, I would get all of these um, public opinion data and sources um, and bring them in and then analyze them over long periods of time and see how we moved over time. Um, and, uh, and then try to attribute that to different things like, is it because of changes in weather patterns or changes in media or changes in politics? Um, and, um, those drivers, we can actually link up to the public opinion data. And you can see that, um, there's an effect of, um, political elite. So when a, uh, someone high up in a political party has a specific view and makes a statement that t tends to make the greatest change on public opinion. Now that's usually filtered through the media, right? You don't actually, unless you're watching C-SPAN, you probably don't see that person say it themselves. But um, the media then helps to uh, show that. Um, and one of the studies we put out recently um, actually shows something called the echo chamber and the boomerang effect. And so the echo chamber means that conservative media tends to only broadcast and, and tailor their message towards their conservative viewers. So it's called an echo chamber, whereas liberal media tends to only broadcast and tailor its message toward liberal viewers. So that helps drive this, this separation. Um, and we also see in some cases some, something called the boomerang effect, which is if a um, liberal media source sends out a message that climate change is happening, climate change is real, you'll actually see a dip in belief in conservatives. They're actually reacting negatively to that message because it comes from the other side. Um, so this political divide is just getting greater right now. Um, and that's kind of scary for climate communication. And one of the things that I really want to emphasize is finding ways to talk about the science as not political. The science itself is not political. The earth itself does not care where you voted or who you voted for. Um, and nature always bats last. So in the end, <laughs> we're all gonna be affected the same way. So we have to find ways to talk about the science that move past the politics. Once we get into the solutions, that becomes political. And I understand that, you know, everybody's gonna have a different opinion about what the right thing to do is. But we have to get everybody on board with the science first. Um, and we just aren't there yet. Yeah. So that's, why that's do you, the tough part. Yeah, I was going to say, why do you think uh, people aren't believing the scientists? You know, mm -hmm. it, it seems like they just don't want to trust what it is that we're saying, even though we're trying to be as objective as possible. I mean, mm -hmm. it's completely impossible to be 100% mm -hmm. objective because your you know, influences of your right. life will always like find their way into your science slightly. But I like to think that most scientists out there try to be as objective as possible mm -hmm. when it comes to discussing these things. So why do you think there is that discrepancy between the public believing what the science is saying and having like their own beliefs when it comes to different issues? 
Mm -hmm. This is this is actually what I'm um, most heavily into studying right now, which is why um, science communication doesn't work the way we think it should. So there's been this long-standing belief in science in science communication called the deficit model, which was basically, and it's mostly been, um, it's not as if it's not as heavily believed in now, but it was, it, it was that the public just doesn't know. And so we just need to give them more information. And the more information we give you them, the more they will understand and come to the scientific consensus. It was like this ignorant public view. And that's just not true. I mean, we do have relatively low levels of science literacy in the United States, but they're not much lower than anywhere else in the world and than any of the other more developed nations that don't have the kind of political divide that we do. So it's not that the public doesn't know or that we can just give them more information. Um, it's that the way that we psychologically take in information is not as an empty sponge. We filter everything that comes into us through our pre-existing beliefs and our ideology. So we are able to take information that comes to us and fit it into the model that we already have about how the world works. So if I'm already part of a tribe uh, that believes that um, vaccines cause um, uh, autism or climate change isn't real, then all of the new information that I get, I'm going to put through that filter. Um, and so there's actually some really interesting studies, for instance, done um, by Dan Gahan at Yale University, where he showed that actually as people's um, science literacy increased, there was a polar more of a polarization on beliefs. So as Republicans, for instance, got more information or had more scientific knowledge, their belief in climate change or their concern for climate change actually goes down because they're able to use that information in, in what's called motivated reasoning to help um, further bolster the ideologies they already have. And that holds true with lots of different subjects. And it, you know, it's not just conservatives who do it. Liberals do it for other things. Um, so for GMO safety, for instance, no matter how much, if you give people more science about the safety of GMOs, they're going to filter it through the ideology they already have, and they will actually continue to widen. So the idea of the deficit model has been sort of, um, it looks, it's looked down on now. Uh, it's been sort of, I wouldn't say debunked because you still have to give people information, right? Like, you, you know, knowledge doesn't come from a vacuum. You still have to give it to people. But you have to change the way in which it's delivered. You can't just expect that showing someone a graph is going to change their ideolo ideological background. It just it doesn't work that way. Um, so that's one of the things that I'm fascinated with right now and that I'm trying to work on right now. Um, finding new ways to measure people's um, concern and their science literacy and how to line those up. And what types of information can you give people that help them to trust scientists more and trust in the expertise of scientists? And also, what ways can scientists be better communicators? Because we don't do it very well. We historically have not done it very well. So what, what can we do better? Yeah. Do you, do you think some of that might be that people just can't relate to scientists? Like I, I know that there was a, a Twitter hashtag that was going out a little while ago called like actual living scientists where, you know, it, there was a, I guess a study that came out that said like most people can't name an actual living scientist. Mm -hmm. So all the different scientists that are on Twitter and the other different mm -hmm. uh, platforms were trying to introduce themselves and show mm -hmm. off like, Hey, we're just normal people too. We're not yeah. always in that lab coat, uh, you know, setting that most people think of when they think of a, a scientist. There's mm -hmm. many different kinds of scientists. Like, mm -hmm. I'm an ecologist. I go out and I play in wetlands in the Great Lakes with mute swans and other species out there. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm very rarely in a lab coat. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so that is really interesting. There's There are a bunch of different studies like that. People don't know, the name of, can't name a living scientist or they name someone who's alive but who isn't a scientist, um, like Al Gore. Mm -hmm. um, and... There's also really interesting studies like draw scientists where they go in and ask students to draw scientists and they invariably draw those guys, um, white men with crazy hair in a lab. And um, it and you see these and, the, you know, they're kids. So part of it is the education system, of course, but also part of it is scientists. We haven't been trained to be public figures. Um, we are discouraged in our communities from activism um, because it's not considered objective. It's not considered scientific. Um, and so people don't really relate to scientists and they don't really know that much about how science 
works. And so one of the things I'm studying right now is actually public understanding of how science works, not at like the, you know, the scientific method, like create a hypothesis um, level, but at the level of the social interaction between scientists. So how do, does competition work in science? Um, how do scientists get paid? Um, one common misconception is that if a scientist rece receives a million dollar grant, that they now have a million dollar salary. Um, and that's just not true. I mean, um, but people, yeah, that's, I mean, what, like the percentage the that, that you'll get of that grant is so yeah. minuscule by the time, like and the money goes to the that. university, it goes to pay your grad mm -hmm. students, it goes to all the, uh, right. like the transportation costs it takes, the equipment. Mm -hmm. I mean, so like the money that actually hits that per scientist's personal pocketbook is like a yeah. small, small percentage of that million dollars. <laughs> Yeah, and then you can sort of trace that to that common misconception that climate scientists, not that common, but that one of the assertions that people make is that climate scientists are making up climate change to make more money. Um, that just doesn't, it doesn't work that way. I mean, they would actually, one of the things that Michael Mann says that's really interesting is um, a scientist would actually be more famous if they could disprove climate change because the vast majority of scientists have come to this consensus. So if you could do the one thing that makes you stand out as different, that's how you're going to get famous, right? But you can't because it's like the the, the evidence is overwhelming. Um, but but again, trying to get people to understand or or testing even do people know where the funding comes from or how peer review works or why it is that having what a consensus means in science. Um, does it just mean that like everybody came into a room together and said yes or you know how much work goes into a consensus? Um, so that level of understanding of science um, is what I'm really fascinated with finding right now and my project um, here at Bucknell public production of public understanding of science we've been working on a measure for that because that may be a better indicator of um, concern over climate change for instance or um, or having beliefs consistent with the scientific consensus on a vast majority of other um, uh, politically controversial uh, sciences. Right. Um, so we're just about out of time here. So I, I just have like, uh, so for anyone out there, if you have any uh, last minute uh, questions, uh, definitely send them in. And I, I've got a question. And um, so like we talk about us, you know, traditionally not being great communicators as scientists. And I know there's a lot of scientists out there that are doing a lot of great communication, but you're, you see kind of like you're more of the, the boots on the street kind of thing, like where you actually are engaging with those people and seeing what they're coming back with. I think a lot of us are, are communicating in that echo chamber that you talked about earlier, you know, where we yeah. talk to other scientists on Twitter and we're not always necessarily doing that outreach. So I guess what kind of, uh, advice would you have for different scientists out there to help them to engage with that public so that way we are kind of uh, branching out of that echo chamber and like having more impact with the general public? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really difficult to do um, because, you know, you can get on social media all you want, but if people aren't following you who aren't scientists, they aren't going to see it. Um, I think something like what you're doing right now is really important and trying to find ways to um, share it beyond the scientific community is really important. Um, and there, you know, any sort of science communication outreach that can be done is really helpful. I think also it means things like um, talking to people around you about your science, people who aren't your colleagues, um, you know, family members or friends of family members or um, you know, the, your neighbor, making it clear to them that they know a scientist um, and that you are whoever you are, you know, you're male, you're female, you're a person of color, you're, you know, somebody other than who they are picturing in the lab. Um, I think that's really important. Um, I, there was a recent um, sort of campaign to get um, scientists to run for political office. And I actually think that would be really interesting and really important to even get involved in local politics at some level. If you know, especially if you're in a different stage of your career than I am, it's not really going to make sense for me right now. But that's something I would consider doing later in life. Um, and getting involved in local groups, local organizations. You know, there's probably if you do some sort of environmental science or even just care about climate, um, getting involved in local environmental organizations. There's a scientist in that group with them. Um, 
that can be helpful for them and it can be helpful for the local community to understand where the scientists are among them, um, especially if it's outside of the university setting in some way. That's yeah, that's some that's some good advice because I, I know that uh, I just found out apparently we have a, a local birding club in mm-hmm. my hometown, which I had never heard of before. But it'd be interesting to know like how many times do they actually engage with a, a real scientist mm-hmm. to have them in, and like when they found out like what it is I do, they're like, oh, can you come talk to us sometime? Yeah, about it? I mean, that's so it's just little things thing. like that are a yeah. great way to engage with people that might not otherwise hear about and there's still people who are they're interested in the outdoors and nature mm-hmm. and they still might not necessarily engage with a scientist unless like you go and become a part of that and sit in and offer to like go talk to them yeah no people really do care i mean if even if they're a local community um places where people you know do presentations in the local community you get community members who show up people are interested um they just you know they just haven't had the, the people aren't the scientists aren't coming out and doing it um, so getting involved in any way you can locally is really excellent. I started hosting a series of workshops here um, called Communicating Beyond the Fire that are about how to talk about climate change to your you know, neighbor who you think might not agree with you. Um, and here where I live, there are a lot of people who don't agree. Um, so uh, doing stuff like that I think is exceptionally important. Um, and uh, that's I definitely recommend that. And if you want to talk a lot about climate change and you want to understand how people understand it and why people think about it the way they do, I really recommend this book. I didn't write it, so this is not a plug, <laughs> a plug for me. I don't know per Espen Stokney's, but I teach this cor- this in my class. It's called What We Think About When We Try Not to Think About Global Warming. And it goes into the, a lot of the psychology and the sociology and then gets into communication strategies. So that's a really good one if you are looking for a, to understand what's going on in people's minds um, and know that they're not stupid or mean. <laughs> they they just have a different ideology than you do. Right. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely a, a big thing to remember is their, where they're coming from is different from where you're coming from. So their understanding of things is going to be different. And so you just have to work through uh, their biases and also your biases as you're coming together to try to help mm-hmm. everyone yep. understand. Yeah, absolutely. So. Working through your own biases is really important for this. So uh, with that, as much as I would love to keep talking, because this has just been fun, because we've been talking for, what, the last hour and a half? Several hours. With all the various <laughs> attempts uh, with this, um, I'm going to uh, let you go, so that way you can actually have the rest of your evening. <laughs> I'm going to go watch Wonder Woman. <laughs> Ooh, I get to go see that, and I really want to go see that. I'm, I hear I'm a really awesome. good thing. Yeah, I was uh, supposed to go with my niece and nephew, and they didn't come uh, this weekend, so... But I definitely want to go see that because I, I just yeah. like the whole idea of that positive uh, woman uh, yeah. for that. So, and plus, it yeah. just looks really cool too. <laughs> yeah, it's been really good. <laughs> so, um, but with that, uh, thank you, uh, Joe, for coming and talking to everyone and sticking around through all the uh, multiple attempts to get this broadcast out. It sounds like uh, through my ear that it's worked this time. So, hopefully, okay. uh, we're good to go. <laughs> thank you but, very much for having me. Yes, yeah, so it, it's been a real pleasure. So, if you have a uh, Further questions for uh, Joe, uh, definitely feel free to tweet her at uh, doc uh, underscore hugs. Uh, and as, also, if you're watching this on replay, definitely uh, feel free to engage with her that way. Um, if you um, want to talk to myself or uh, about the broadcast, feel free to either engage with me at the uh, SciCon Monday handle or at my personal handle of Wildlife BioGal. And then uh, for everyone to tune in for next week, uh, we'll be talking to Dr. David Coyle. He's out of uh, the University of Georgia and he deals with forest health. So we're going to be talking about how invasive species, climate change, and a whole bunch of other factors uh, can impact um, the health of the different forests in the uh, southeast and greater. And then I also want to uh, definitely send a quick shout out to uh, Amanda Hips. She's a uh, grad student at Florida Atlantic University. Uh, she uh, correctly guessed uh, what species and uh, character I was talking about on Zootopia with my Instagram uh, challenge that I threw out for everyone. So uh, please follow her both on Instagram and uh, Twitter. She does a lot of great uh, science communication and she works with uh, what species are burrowing in uh, or using uh, tortoise burrows uh, down there in the Southeast. So uh, follow along with her. And then um, for all of my uh, Twitter uh, patrons out there, thank you. Thank you very much for helping uh, uh, support this broadcast. It it really is appreciated. Uh, Without you, uh, this would not happen. And then for anyone out there who enjoyed the broadcast, 
uh, please go to our uh, Patreon uh, page and uh, see how you can help us to uh, make sure that this science uh, um, science communication keeps uh, going and we're able to uh, share it uh, with everyone out there. And uh, with that, I want to uh, thank everyone for uh, tuning in. Uh, please go out, explore, do some science, have some fun, and we'll see you next time on SciComm Monday.